Smoke inhalation is a complicated and serious illness from which many people die, but oftentimes it's dismissed as just smoke inhalation. We have to change our attitude and look at the issue with new eyes. And if we can do that, we can start saving lives. Sometimes we make decisions that are based on what I think is old medicine. It really makes you wonder if we may be changing the landscape, not only for cyanide exposure, but also for carbon monoxide exposure. I think it's incumbent upon every American firefighter to understand the toxicity of smoke, and not only to understand it for their own safety, but for their family's safety, for the people we swore to protect. Hi, I'm Rob Schnepp. Smoke is everywhere and the fire service knows it. You know it. It's also well known that smoke kills more people than flames. Often, carbon monoxide gets all the credit when we think about the dangers of smoke exposure. Rarely acknowledged is hydrogen cyanide, which is created during the combustion process of burning laminates, synthetics, foams, plastics, and even wood. Nearly everything in our homes and offices today. And when smoke inhalation victims are exposed to both toxicants, their medical conditions become much more complicated. In short, hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide are deadly together. This is why we call them the toxic twins. Up until now, the vast majority of firefighters would equate the worst cases or releases of carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide with hazmat incidents, or chemical warfare, or an industrial accident, or some other sort of dangerous situation. And you know, that if dispatched to any one of these incidents where carbon monoxide or hydrogen cyanide was identified or suspected, your approach would change, your tactics would change, and most importantly, your perception of the hazard would change. And that's the key. As you sit there today watching this video, be prepared to change your perception of fire smoke. And so they'll call me up and say, oh, we got another kit we want to try to get. We need some cyanide poison people. And so usually I just call one of the union halls and say, you know, you guys have a fire in the last day. And they're like, yeah. I said, all right, I need five guys who are at the fire. Just bring them down and test them. They always have cyanide in their blood. You know, any firefighter has been in a fire. They always have some. Hydrogen cyanide is generated during the combustion of all kinds of household and workplace items. Items like sofas, cabinets, desks, drapes, blankets and carpets. Hydrogen cyanide is not immediately identifiable by the smoke. Not by its color or its amount. Hydrogen cyanide is invisible and only detected through metering and monitoring. Here are some important values to think about. The immediately dangerous life and health value, IDLH, for hydrogen cyanide is 50 parts per million. As you can see, NIOSH's recommended exposure limit is 4.7 parts per million. OSHA's permissible exposure limit is 10 parts per million. And the Environmental Protection Agency's acute exposure guideline level, where life-threatening effects or death will occur, are 27 parts per million for 10 minutes, or 21 parts per million for 30 minutes. Let me share with you a few real-world examples. Here's a pan on the stove, moderate smoke, 22 parts per million of hydrogen cyanide. A dumpster fire, 25 parts per million of hydrogen cyanide. This is a bigger example, a warehouse fire, 26 parts per million detected around the exterior, not in the active fire, but at the exterior of the building. Think about where your command post might be placed in a scene like this. Small fire in an apartment complex, had nothing more than smoldering cabinets, pot on the stove, very little fire damage, generated 30 parts per million. This slide shows a reading from a training exercise, 48 parts per million of cyanide. What's interesting about this is the reading was taken at the backside of a burn building with only hay used as a fuel for the training fires. These meter readings that you see are taken by firefighters, your colleagues. They're not doctors, they're not scientists, they're not researchers doing work during controlled fires in a laboratory setting. Are you surprised? You shouldn't be. Hydrogen cyanide is your new invisible enemy. Accept that. 
When we put on our hat of pre-hospital care provider, we need to be conscious that the inhalation victim is exposed to the incipient stage of the fire. This is the combustion process when hydrogen cyanide is the most prevalent. So one of my philosophies is that the key to this whole thing is to get the ball rolling in the pre-hospital setting. Clearly the sooner we get started the better. Uh, in a couple of the cases we saw them develop neurologic symptoms, some recovery of neurologic function halfway through the first bottle. And as you know for an adult it's, it comes in two bottles and it's a, it's a two bottle administration. But halfway through the first bottle they started moving. And so what that tells me is that it's very you know, rapidly acting, at least in taking, you know, getting to the point where the brain can start to function again. And man, I'll tell you what, if it's with my firefighter or my family member, I want that happening as soon as possible. So we're gonna get it started in the field, but the number one most important reason is that's patient care oriented. We, we've used a, a fairly large number of times here, more so quite honestly than I had anticipated. Uh, a fire where the second in company uh, went in to fight the fire, there was a flashover. Uh, when that occurred, uh, a captain somehow got a away from the pack, and uh, as soon as they came out, they recognized he was missing. They immediately went back in. They found him in the room adjacent to where the flashover had occurred. No helmet, no face mask. They dragged him out. Uh, again, it's difficult getting folks out when you can't see what's going on. They got him out. Uh, we got him on the heart monitor uh, while we were doing CPR, and he was confirmed to be in a systole. No heart activity at all. A similar story, CPR, oxygen, intubation, epinephrine, give the ACLS drugs, uh, and added the hydroxycobalamin. Uh, again, a very rough, rocky, prolonged road in the hospital. He has uh, pretty significant burns to his face and to his hands, not surprisingly, uh, but he is back to work, 100% neurologically intact. He's a father, he's a husband, he's a firefighter. Tragically, one early uh, New Year's morning, there was a fire in a home with three little girls. Uh, ages ranged from six to uh, 12, I believe. Uh, one of the girls came out, was awake, uh, coughing, had smoke inhalation, but was awake. Uh, the other two, the other two sisters came out, uh, one with agonal respirations, the other one not breathing at all. Both got CPR, they both got the uh, cyanocobalamin, or uh, hydroxycobalamin kit. And um, again, a very long, course in the hospital with the burns and uh, they went through all kinds of complications, metabolic complications, but in the end uh, they're back at school as a, as a family unit. All three little girls are together again.